Hello, today's been a fun day, so I'm probably going to end up recording the next part on Wednesday. So I'll put this up with that on Wednesday, so there's at least two videos going up on Wednesday. As I doubt I'll get any done on Tuesday. So, I hope you've had a good day. I hope you've had a good, I hope you had a good, you enjoyed the first part of The Long Patrol. And I hope you enjoyed all that was covered. So this is part three, and this looks at the second group a set of the Fiji group, which are rather cute, the Crown in the Crown Colony class. And of course, it starts off with HMS Trinidad. Now, I love Trinidad. I know she's lost. In May 1942, but she's also pretty. And she's lost while serving on the Arctic convoys, and frankly, nothing, absolutely nothing, will convince me that any ship that was lost on serving on the Arctic convoys is demonstration of an inherently bad design. They were absolutely nightmares up there. And frankly, the fact that they survived the weather is always amazing to me. Trinidad was built by Her Majesty's Dockyard in Devonport. So she's one of the few which are actually built by the Royal Navy. And that's always, that always gets up people sort of go, why did the Royal Navy have dockyards? Well, A, they're partially a legacy thing, but also they were fairly cost-effective uh, cost effective thing to have when the Navy was bigger, especially if the Navy wanted to introduce innovative new ideas like welding or push through experimental ships like Dreadnought, etc. in a hurry. Having your own dockyard that you control the security of, you control the trained personnel of, and you can decide what they're going to do, and are civil servants rather than necessarily uh, stand ducky workers who worked to various different rules in this time, is actually quite a sensible idea when you have a fleet of sufficient size to justify it. In fact, if ever there is a return to space navies, well, unless I return to Space Navies and a creation of Space Navies, I wouldn't be surprised if you do get dockyards having to be built which are government owned. Why? Because do you want to have civilian yards which have the ability to install weapons on a ship which is going into a definitively lawless space? Sounds like a good way to create yourself a piracy problem. But we'll leave that to one side. Anyway, Trinidad. She was laid down on 21st of April 1938, launched 21st of March 1941, and commissioned on the 14th of October 1941. So, she would be in commissioned service, let's say October, because it might be halfway through October, but Octo uh, 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 she is October, November, December, January. February, March, April, May, and she's actually scuttled on May the 15th due to damage. So technically, you could say she's in the service eight. You could possibly make the argument for seven months. That's not long. She served with the home fleet for all that career. And whilst escorting convoy PQ-13 in March 1942, she and other escorts were, were in combat with what are called German Navik-class destroyers. Now, Navik-class destroyers are tend to refer to the 1936A destroyers, but not necessarily all of them. And it, it tends to be the mob who are referred to more as that. Uh, 
the A's, they all start, well, the A's do start, are laid down in 1938 and are commissioned in 1940-1941. They're referred to as the Narvik because supposedly they have Narvik experience built into them and they're a reaction to Narvik in their design. But honestly, I don't agree with that as much. In fact, my thinking is that it's not the 36 BAs that you have to think of as the Narvik reactions. But the 36 Bs. And the fact that three of these are completed is an interesting time. But anyway, she is engaged by Z26, which is very much a 36A of the original type. She's actually, uh, they, they actually sync. Z26. Now, the thing is, while she's attacking Z26 and other destroyers, she launches her own torpedoes. One of which does a bit of a misrun. Instead of uh, the ship, of course, is zigzagging to avoid being torpedoed itself by submarines or by destroyers, and her torpedo runs a lot slower than expected. They're supposed to be running at 46 knots, which means it should be perfectly fine for her to zig back over where the torpedo is right into the torpedo's route. Fortunately, it isn't fine because it's not, and that torpedo strikes Trinidad. It kills 32 men. And damages the ship quite badly. And it's in icy waters. But she's towed clear of the action and is then able to proceed under her own power to Murmansk. The German submarine U-378 uh, attempted to engage and sink the cruiser, but was spotted and destroyed by HMS Fury, the same ship which this photo of her, which you can see on the screen, was taken from. And yes, I know it's not the best resolution, but that's the best version of that photo I can find, and frankly, it's a cool photo. Trinidad underwent partial repairs in Murmansk. And then she tried to set out to return home on the 13th of May 1942, escorted by Foresight, Forrester, Somali, and Matchless. I think there's a slight sadness there because whilst she does have a tribal with her, uh, HMS Fury had really protected that ship and made sure she got safely to Murmansk. And I, I do wonder if she was a bit of a lucky totem for Trinidad because. Whilst other ships at home fleet were providing a covering force nearby, and her speed is overall is reduced to 20 knots. So that's the maximum speed she can maintain en route. And she's attacked by 20 Ju 88s on the 14th of May 1942. All attacks miss except for one bomb that struck near the previous damage. And a damage point, which has already been hit by a torpedo, is not going to be a good point to have a bomb hit. It starts a serious fire, and 63 more were lost. This includes 20 survivors from HMS Edinburgh, the town class which had been sunk, the vessel which had been sunk two weeks earlier. At this point, the decision was taken to scuttle her, and on the 15th of May 1942, she's torpedoed by Matchless and sinks in the Arctic Ocean, just north of Cape. Um, interesting enough, she had had seven. Czechoslovakian airmen en route to Great Britain on board her, and also amongst the dead of the of, who died in her second attack were Sergeant Vraslav Lastovica, Corporals Jan Ferek, Josef Navziknik, and Bushlav Zikmund. Three, the, three airmen, though, did get away. It's sad. It's sad. (laughs) 
Now, of course, I talked about HMS Trinidad, but it's not Trinidad, it's Trinidad and Tobago. That's the colony, that's the member of the Commonwealth, that's the state as it is today. So, what is HMS Tobago? Well, there's not just the Crown Colony class cruisers, there is also the Colony class frigates, which I do think is the British annoying the Americans a bit because they are Tacoma class patrol ships, frigates, which are an American version of the British. River class frigate. And they are built uh, by Walsh Kaiser of Providence, uh, Rhode Island, um, and transferred under lend lease to the Royal Navy, and they're named for relatively minor colonies. One of the interesting things is, I have to say, is after this one, I was asked about an HMS Falklands. And there have been two ships named Falkland, which are probably named after the Royal Borough of Falkland in Fife rather than the Falkland Islands. Uh, which was an 18 gun sloop and a 54 gun four freighter line. There's also been an HMS Falkland prize which was captured by HMS Falkland and HMS Dreadnought in 1704 and renamed. And interesting enough, HMS Falkland, the 1696 one, uh, was the first warship to be built in the United States. But no, no Falkland in this list. The Crown Colony class are displaced 1,264 long tons, or 1,284 tons. They had a length of 303 feet, 11 inches, a beam of 370, uh, 37 feet, 6 inches, and a draft of 13 foot, 8 inches. Their power came from three boilers, supplying two steam turbines, each generating 5,500 5, shaft horsepower. That's not 55,000, I had I did an extra zero and I've left it in rather than correcting it because I'm probably it's gonna make you all laugh what the idea of what a ship of uh, roughly one, fa uh, let's say 1300 tons with 55,000 shaft horsepower would achieve. We can all imagine that it'll be a lot faster on the top speed of 20 knots. That we do know. Compliment, 190. Armament, three 3-inch three 50, uh, 50 AA guns in single mounts, four 40mm guns in twin mounts, and nine 20mm in nine single mounts, plus a headshot projector, eight Y-gun depth charge projectors, two depth charge racks. So she's definitely much an anti-submarine convoy AA escort. And the reason they are produced is literally the Americans want to produce a frigate and they're using the British design. But the British design has four inch guns, all sorts of things which are British tech. It's far easier to build using American tech as you're building in America than to try and ship the British tech over from Britain. And giving some more to the British is just a nice way, and a nice way of working with Lend Lease. So there's HMS Anguilla, HMS Antigua, HMS Ascension, HMS Bahamas, HMS Barbados, HMS Calicos, HMS Cayman, HMS Dominica, HMS Lambuan, that's ex HMS Gold Coast. Then there's HMS Montserrat, HMS Niceland, HMS Papua, HMS Perim, ex HMS Sierra Leone, HMS Pitcairn, HMS Sarawak, HMS Seychelles, HMS Somaliland, HMS Sanhela, Sanhela, HMS Tobago, which was originally going to be Hong Kong, and HMS Totola, and HMS Zanzibar. They're cute ships, and they have an interesting war. There are 21 built and 21 retire. Not one of them is sunk on active service. So, woohoo. They're one you want to be on. HMS Calicos was uh, sold to Argentina as Santissima Trinidad, or later Commodoro Augustus Lazea. Um, HMS Papua was sold to Egypt and sunk in the Gulf of Suez in 1953. And HMS Tobago 
was sold to Egypt and scuttled as a blockship in the Suez Canal in 1956. Ah, oh, good times, good times had by all. And if anyone can find a decent picture of Tobago, please do send it to me because I've been trying to hunt one. And that's the ship I'm talking about, not the island. Island's lovely. And now we have HMS of Jamaica. And you can see the gun crew. Now, what I would point out about that lovely stage photo of the gun crew is you'll notice that they're only loading one gun of the three guns in the turret. And none of the extra people who are there in case anything happens to any of those people are crammed in there. Plus, none of the people who would be coordinating all those people and for all three guns in there are in there. So it looks lovely and spacious. Beautiful. I'm saying tell it's stage for a, a photo shot. Right then. HMS Jamaica. Laid down at Biggers Armstrong, Baron Furness, on the 20th of April 1939, launched on the 6th of November 1940, and commissioned on 29th of June 1942. She's decommissioned on 20th of November 1957 and is stricken, tend to be um, broken up, scrapped in 1960. Her motto is Non Sibi Sed Patriae. I, uh, that which translates as not for oneself, but for one's country. Her nicknames include the Fighting Jay, the Galloping Ghost on the North Korean coast, and uh, yeah, fun times. Now, she was about 8,770 tons in standard, and about 11,194 tons in deep load, apparently. So uh, yeah, really sticking to the um, rules here. After working up in 1942, she provides distant convoy to P uh, distant cover to convoy PQ-18. After this, she's assigned to the Centre Task Force of Operation Torch in early November, where she's unsuccessfully attacked by the Vichy French sub uh, the Fresne. Yes, the Vichy French. Well, for some reason, they didn't like the idea of Operation Torch. Especially not after the invasion of Madagascar. But there is um, still a way to go between the idea of the French being a neutral nation after they have been taken out by the uh, German, uh, surrenders of Germans in World War II and the reality. Some of their forces were downright involved. After the convoys, after PQ-18, um, convoys in the Arctic began again with convoy JW-51A. Jamaica and Sheffield, shiny chef, always lovely to go on, and lovely town class cruiser, which likes to go out with Crown Colonies every now and again. With several escorting destroyers, Form Force R, under the command of Rear Admiral Robert Burnett, and tasked to cover, uh, to cover the convoy against any German surface ships. The convoy wasn't spotted by the Germans and arrived at Kuala in in Inlet without incident on the 20th of December. Great Christmas in Russia. It's what we all, uh, we all want to spend it in the middle of World War II. Christmas in Russia. Borsar sailed from Kuala on the 27th of December to rendezvous with convoy JW-51B in the Norwegian Sea. But that convoy had been blown southwards by a major storm. Yes. Even non-sail ships can get blown off course by a major storm. The sea is not a nice place. It tends to pick you up and move you where it wants to go, especially if it's excited enough. Several ships have been separated during the storm, and they confused the radar of four sail ships as to the true location of the convoy. Thus, the four sail was 30 miles north of the convoy on the 31st of December when Admiral Hipper, that's the German heavy cruiser, shows up. Unfortunately, Admiral Hipper's idea of having a good time is rather upset by a guy called Captain Sherbrooke, a former tribal class destroyer captain of HMS Cossack, and now a flotilla leader. And his destroyers, HMS Onslow, Obedient, and Obdurate, and Orwell. 
they decide that rather than being cowed by the fact they are collectively outmassed by HIPAA, um, that actually what HIPAA is, is a rather large target that they are going to keep attacking until one of them can get some torpedoes into her. HIPAA decides that it's facing insane people, uh, and that's in the night, uh, that's in the sense of the ways of they, they cannot uncompute what they're doing. They're saying there's no logic, they have they're beyond bravery, they do not understand the reality in front of them, is what the Germans are sort of believing has happened. So they're driven off. And then they return later on with some German destroyers to back them up. Unfortunately, by the time they return, their R Force R has also arrived on the scene. And so Hippa is hit by three six inch shells fired from the cruisers. Even more fun for those cruisers is the Two German destroyers, the Z16 Friedrich Einhardt and the Z4 Richard Belton, misidentify Sheffield as Admiral Hipper and attempt to form up on her. I don't know what they where what they thought Jamaica was. If they thought here Sheffield, which was uh, was Hipper in front of Jamaica, and they, what did they think Jamaica was? Anyway. Um, Sheffield decided to sink the Frederick Eichhold at a range of two miles, whilst Jamaica unsuccessfully engaged Richard Belton. Less now later, uh, the Lutzow and Admiral Hipper, uh, uh, Lutzow arrived to back up the Admiral Hipper. So now she has the lovely Gra sister of the Graf Spey, formerly, uh, formerly Deutschland, Lutzow. There. They opened the fire. Again, uh, this at this point you'd expect two heavy cruisers versus two light cruisers. Uh, you know the impressive eleven-inch guns of the Lutzow. All this going on, you would be expecting the British to be, I don't know, running away, going. We need to sail ships. And they do not do this. They mm, open fire and keep engaging quite happily. Neither sky aside might have scored any hits in the darkness before both sides ended up turning away. Borsar continued to track the German ships several hours before they lost contact. And although the destroyer HMS Achates and the minesweeper HMS Bramble had been sunk by the Kriegsmarine, the convoy itself, a merchant ship, reached Kuala in, uh, in, uh, intact. So, honestly, you have to consider that a victory. After all, the Germans have been beaten off, the convoy has got there successfully, the British have lost a destroyer and a minesweeper, but the Germans have lost a destroyer and the British have a lot more destroyers where that's coming from. Because that's to be honest, in the time the Germans are commissioning five or six more destroyers, the British are commissioning 30 to 40 more destroyers. It's World War I all over again. Jamaica was then relieved of escort duties as HMS Berwick and HMS Kent turn up to relieve Sheffield and her of them. And she goes home, uh, she rejoins the home fleet uh, to be refitted from July to September. Um, she receives at some point during this time um, six twin power operated 20mm AA guns as well as four single guns to up her firepower in the case of air attack. But again, it's 20 millimeter. We all know how effective 20 millimeter is versus it has more of a morale boost than necessarily a weapon of war. When you're dealing with aircraft, you want range. During November, she protects convoys RA-54B, JW-54A, JW-54B, and RA-54B, but was not engaged. On the 15th of December, she signed to Force 2, the distant escort for convoy uh, JW-55A, along with the battleship HMS Duke of York and four destroyers. Force 2 was commanded by Admiral Bruce Fraser, the commander-in-chief of the home fleet coming out himself. In Duke of York, unsurprisingly, although it would have been kind of interesting to watch him trying to command uh, commanding the fleet from Jamaica. 
For the first time, the British didn't cover force was going to escort the convoy all the way to Carl Inlet. There was a reason for this. There was a suspicion that the Germans were going to be sending out the Scharnhorst. There was an idea that the Germans would be getting a battleship ready. And honestly, I think Fraser was trying to protect the Germans from the upset of their battleships getting beaten up by cruisers. It's bad enough their heavy cruisers are getting beaten up by British destroyers. And their heavy, their the British light cruisers are completely ignoring the fact they're fighting heavy cruisers and not getting scared at all. It, it that's bad enough for the poor Kriegsmarine, but at this point, I think Fraser's feeling sorry for them, and he feels if Scharnholz comes out, the least he could do is be there in a nice big battleship to greet her warmly. Anyway. Charles does come out to take on JW-55B, and this results in the Battle of the North Cape. On the 26th December, Scharnhorst is escorted out by five destroyers of the Germans' 4th Flotilla. The resulting... Uh, well, no. The Germans spot the convoy on the 22nd of December, and they she's escorted out on Christmas Day on the 25th of December to intercept it. The resulting engagement is not fun for anyone other than the British, perhaps. Germans were spotted on the morning of the 26th of December, so someone thought Boxing Day was coming, and were engaged by the covering force of the convoy. The covering force of the convoy included the cruisers HMS Bearfield, uh, Belfast, I mean, HMS Sheffield, and HMS Norfolk, and four destroyers. So again, there are two rather large town-class light cruisers, a full-size county-class heavy cruiser, and four destroyers, none of whom understand this concept of, you're a battleship, we should be afraid of you. Meanwhile, Jamaica and Duke of York are approaching as fast as they can from the southwest, which means Sharnors can't even retreat, although she doesn't realize it. The German battleship decides to turn for a base at Antreford in the early afternoon um, after two brief encounters with the British cruisers. At this point, she's spotted by Duke of York's Type 273 radar at a range of 45,000 yards, or a little nearly 42 kilometers. Half an hour later, when they're practically at what is almost spitting range for a, a battleship, Duke of York opens fire. Jamaica adds her first salvo a minute later and hits Shan Horse on her third broadside. That's impressive. She's forced to cease fire after 19 volleys, as the German ship is faster in the heavy seas than the British ships, and was opening up range despite the heavy damage from the British ships. At this point, one shell from the Duke of York's last volley penetrates Scharnhorst's number one boiler room and destroys it. This then reduces the German ship's top speed sufficiently for the British destroyers to catch up and decide, well, they've been trying to get a German battleship for a while. You just have to ask Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, which Glowworm tried to take on. Um, not Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, she tried to take on Hitler, didn't she? No, it was... Uh, was it who was the destroyer which tried to take on Scharnhorst and Eisenhower? Oh, I'll remember that another time. But there's the tribals which are in place after HIPAA. Basically, British destroyers have been trying to get a battleship on their list of kills from the beginning of World War II, and they've been trying hard. Now they can finally think they can get one. They make four torpedo hits using a pincer attack. This slowed Scharnhorst again, but didn't sink up. So Jamaica and Duke of York managed to catch up and open fire at a range of 10,400 yards, or nine and a half kilometers. They hit the German ship continually, but she's still not sinking after 20 minutes of firing. So Jamaica torpedoes her. Two torpedoes from her first volley of three missed, 
but the th and the third misfired so the cruiser had to turn around to fire her other broadside of three two of which appeared to hit then belfast and destroyers also fire some torpedoes in the shanhorst before sanhorst uh, before she finally sinks Between February and March 1944, Jamaica served as part of covering forces for convoys JW-57, JW-58, and RA-58. And then she's attached to an escort the aircraft carrier HMS Victorious as she launches an airstrike against Terrapits as part of Operation Tungsten. In July, she forms part of the covering force for the carriers Formidable, Furious, and Indivadical during an unsuccessful attack on the German battleship Tirpitz, berthed in Carrefourd, which is when it's, she's, uh, she's berthed in Carrefourd, uh, Operation Mascot. Again, where are we coming up with these operation names? What happens to the British government when it comes to naming operations? Ah, sorry, I've taken so long with, ja uh, with Jamaica, it's skipped on to Gambia, I do apologise. I had these size set for 12 minutes. Before starting a major refit in October. That in October 1940, uh, October 1944, the last to April 1945. This is when she loses, finally loses her X turret. And that's replaced by more 40 millimeter mounts. And her radar suite is modernized as well. On the 6th of June 1945, she conveys King George VI and the Queen on a visit to the Channel Islands. Uh, they're not getting any closer, they're not allowed. And then Jamaica joins the 5th Cruiser Squadron in Colombo in October, placing HMS Norfolk as the squadron flagship in April 1946. She returns to Devonport for refit in November 1977, and then transferred to North American West Indies Station in August 1948. She's finally sent to, uh, she's sent to Hong Kong in April 1949 and remains in the Far East until the Korean War began in June 1950. In 19, June 1950, when the Korean War started, she was on a passage to Japan. She and her escort, HMS Black Swan, the sloop, were ordered to rendezvous with the American light cruiser US Juno off the coast of Korea to bombard advanced North Korea, advancing North Korean troops. And on the 2nd of July, a North Korean supply convoy was returning from Shunjin when it was spotted by the Allied ships. The escorting motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats turned to fight, but the three torpedo boats and both gunboats were sunk without inflicting any damage on the Allied ships. For some reason, that sheer amount of six inch guns was enough to cause a, to get rid of them. And that's before we consider the sheer fun HMS Black Swan was having at this point. They resumed, and as a start of results, they resumed bombarding coastal targets. Six days later, Jamaica was hit by a 75 mm French shell that killed six and wounded five. On the 15th of August, the ship bombarded captured harbour facilities in Kinsan. And the following month, Jamaica participated in the barrage bombing of the island of Walmido uh, before the main landing on the 15th of September. And that is the Battle of Inchon. During the landing itself, she supported the southern flank of the assault and was tasked to support the 1st Marine Regiment afterwards. Two days after the landing, Jamaica and the American Navy cruiser Uchis Rochester were attacked by a pair of Yakolov piston engine fighters at dawn. One aircraft succeeded in strafing the ship, killing one sailor before it was shot down by the ship's guns. After this point, Jamaica is sent to refit in Singapore in October and sails for home after it's completed. Arriving in Plymouth in February 1952, she's placed in reserve. She's not recommissioned again till 1954 to serve in the training fleet. And, in, and during that time, she also end up in sort of between the end of 1955 and spring of 1956. She plays HMS Exeter in the war film, The Battle of River Plate. She then participates in Operation Musketeer. That's the Suez Crisis in November 1956. And she's ship leading the bombardment force covering Royal Marine landings at Port Said, but she was not permitted to fire her main guns. Remember, they, the cabinet have banned the cruisers from using their guns because they're worried about civilian casualties unless it was absolutely necessary. So the cruisers are in charge and coordinating it and acting as the flagships, 
but it's the battle class destroyers and other destroyers with their four and a half inch guns which are really leading it and, and blasting away. She's then placed in reserve again in September 1958 after a port visit to Kiel, and she's sold in 1960. Scrapping. HMS Gambia. Right then. So, she's laid down 24 July 1939, uh, launched 19, November 1940, and commissioned February 1942. She's transferred to the Royal New Zealand Navy on the 22nd of September 1943, where they call her HMZS Gambia. She's then returned to the Royal Navy again on the 27th of March 1946. She returns to becoming HMS Gambia. And is eventually um, scrapped. Um, how to put this? Scrapped in nineteen sixty-eight. She saw service in the East Indies with the British Eastern Fleet and was involved in the Battle of Madagascar in September nineteen forty-two. She then carries out trade protection duties in the Indian Ocean, but returns to home waters for a refit. Calling into Gambia on the way, where West African chiefs in full regalia led thousands of their subjects to visit the ship and named after Colleen and to bless it. As we all know, that worked well for HMS Asante and HMS New Zealand. Not so well for HMS Maori, which didn't manage to get her blessing. So, um, you know, good thing to do. Uh, yeah. September that year, 1942, New Zealand's a bit worried. Their two other crews at the time, HMS NS Leander and HMS NS Achilles, had both been damaged, and it was decided that Gambia would be recommissioned as HMNZS Gambia for the use of the Royal New Zealand Navy. Uh, she was commissioned under the command of Captain William Powlett, of Royal Navy, and a few of the officers and three quarters of the ratings were New Zealanders. New Zealand High Commissioner visited the Gambia and addressed the ship's company after sea trials, shaking down, and 10 days attached to the first cruiser squadron scrapper flow working up. She arrives in Plymouth, and at that point, she sent off to work with HMS Glasgow and Enterprise in part of Operation Stonewall. Yes, they are trying to stop those German blockade runners, those pesky blockade runners getting out of France. Why do they keep calling it? They called it Operation Stonewall. I do not know. What is people's attached to a Stonewall? Stonewalls are not that amazing. They are. Uh, they, it sounds cool, but really, when you look at think about most Stonewalls, let's be honest, most dry Stonewalls you can clamber over. That's not going to stop a lot of things. I suppose they mean it Stonewall in terms of the castle, but they could have said uh, Operation Crenellation or Meticulation. You know, there are lots of things they could have gone with other than a stone wall. Of particular note during this operation was the pursuit of the gem blockade runner Osmana, Ozono, and the destruction of another blockade runner under the command of uh, Captain William Bart's overall command. But unfortunately, Gambia, despite having the senior officer on it and him really wanting to get, be involved and being in charge, they were too far away, so he was set. He was actually had forced to sit on the radio and just coordinate Glasgow and Enterprise without being able to do more really than listen in. At this point, she sent off to serve the British Pacific Fleet, where she participates in attack, uh, attacks on Japanese positions throughout the Pacific. And in February 1944, she block uh, she searches for blockade runners in the Cocos Islands and carries out a series of carry raids against oil installations and airfields. She saw action off Okinawa, Formosa, and Japan. And she was attacked by a Japanese kam uh, kamikaze aircraft as the ceasefire was announced. And is in Tokyo Bay for the signing of the Japanese instrument of surrender. She's very quickly returned to the Royal Navy and after refit is recommissioned on 1st July 1946 for service with 5th Cruiser Squadron in the Far East. She returns to the UK in January 1948. And in January 1950, is assigned to the second cruiser squadron in Mediterranean. In 1953, she and her sister Bermuda took aid to the Greek island of Zakynos after it was struck by the Ionian earthquake. And Greeks would later comment, we Greeks are a long-standing tradition in the Royal Navy, and it lived up to every expectation in its infallible tra uh, tradition of always being the first to help. 
which does do good things for the Royal Navy. She's the flagship of 4th Cruiser Squadron in 1955, but when the decision is made in this in the East Indies not to refit and continue with HMS Vanguard, the battleship, funds were available for what was considered a life extension of Gambia and Bermuda, uh, along with additional finance and equipment from US assistance to NATO, which gave them an increased AAR and allowed them to be pretty effective. Although they didn't keep the, quite the same IA upgrade, and they did keep some of the British systems. As whilst the American systems were felt to be, in some respects, more accurate and more advanced that way, the British systems sometimes had a bit of a heavier punch. And it was a mixture of the two, and it was felt that it was complementary. In May 1937, Gambia sailed to the Persian Gulf and became the last flagship for the Commander-in-Chief East Indies, Vice Admiral Hillary Briggs. Um, she returned to Rosyth in September 1958. And in 1958, she then <laughs> recommissioned to the first cruise squadron in the Mediterranean. She deploys the Far East in 1959 to relieve, relieve HMS Ceylon in the Red Sea, and finally returns to the UK via South Africa with visits to Freetown and Gambia before arriving in Portsmouth in July 1960, where she begins her last few months of service. She's paid off into reserve in December 1960, and was put up for disposal and scrapping almost immediately. She's sent on tow, and on December 1968 is actually is scrapped. Now, it's kind of interesting that she sort of takes so long to go 1968, 1960 to 1968 before she's gone to be scrapped. Uh, the British did kind of slow, the, the Admiralty did kind of slow walk her through, because you have to remember this period, the early 1960s, yes, there's been a lot of technological change and there's a lot of good reasons to get be wanting newer ships and investing in newer ships, but it takes time to get those ships online. And so slow walking some of the more advanced, some of the better quality ships through their scrapping process meant that the Treasury couldn't cut them, again, because they'd already been cut, but they were they were necessarily available to be reactivated if they need to be. Now we have Bermuda, the last of the A's ships, and yeah, she's a cool ship. She's laid down in 1939, November. She's launched September 1941 and commissioned August 1942. She's decommissioned in 1962 and will be scrapped in 1965, another one who slow walked. Her displacement originally is about 8,500 tons standard and about 10,500 tons full loaded. She participates in a North African campaign, including Operation Torch, along with Shiny Chef, that lovely town class cruiser which has turned up quite a lot with the various Crown colonies. She covered the landing at Boogie, and now well, does a fair number of things. With uh, takes part in Biscay in the operations in Biscay, so that's Operation Stonewall, and uh, participates in anti-submarine operations against Joan U-boat U-boats, as well as the uh, surface raiders there, and then returns to Glasgow in June 1944 for a refit. She's built by John Brown and Company on the Clyde Bank, so she Glasgow is her home. That refit in 1944 removes her ex-turret, and she's then dispatched to the Pacific, where she arrives in Fremantle on the 1st of July, 1945, to take on fuel and stores before continuing on to Sydney, where she arrives on the 7th of July. Then she undertakes an exercise with the Royal Navy ships in the Far East, including HMS Anson, that lovely battleship. And whilst in Sydney, uh, news reaches them of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the subsequent Japanese surrender. Bermuda then sails for the Philippines, arriving on 23rd of August. She takes part in the operation to recover Allied prisoners of war from previously occupied Japanese territories. On the 6th of September, Bermuda was attacked by Japanese aircraft. Um, they were they were always claimed they're unaware of the end of the war, or otherwise perhaps they were unwilling to surrender. This is why wars, when they end, it's often not a neat thing. Bermuda fought off the attack and was able to continue on her way. She then transplanted Allied prisoners of war to Shanghai for repatriation. 
Post-war, she continues in the Far East as flagship of the 5th Cruiser Squadron until 1947. Then she returns to the UK for a refit at Chatham Dockyard. And then she's placed in reserve. In 1950, she's restored for active service and serves in South Atlantic as flagship of the Commander in Chief South Atlantic Station until 1953. She then moves on to the Mediterranean, where she and her sister, Gambia, of course, take part in the Taking aid to Zinafos, uh, Zakinov's office. <clears throat> in 1956, she's paid off and towed up to Palmas at Heaven Time to undergo a long refit. She's updated large in the same pattern as Gambia was, in the same enclosed bridge added on, and US supplied Mark 63 directors for a four inch twin gun mounts. But she maintains the tachymetric fire control for the new twin Mark V 40mm mounts. Uh, which were repositioned to have for better arcs of fire still. And that's a good idea in some respects, because the tachymetric system is in many ways more forgiving than the new American system was. Because one represented the um, uh, beginning of new technology with all the fun of it, and one represented in many ways the peaking plateau of what was by then a well-practiced technology. She returns to service and spends the next few years in exercise with other NATO navies or other Royal Navy units. In April 1958, she left Malta to assist in the reinforcement of Cyprus during a period of civil unrest. And, it, and then Bermuda attends the ceremony of independence in Nigeria on the 1st of October 1960 before joining the training fleet to relieving the cruise of Tiger on station. She's decommissioned in 1962 after 21 years of service and she's scrapped in 1965. She made during her time several visits for her namesake, uh, where she was presented with a number of silver objects, including a large bell, which was occasionally used as a font for holy water in the baptism of children of the crew, and four bugles. Two of the bugles later found their way to the Bermuda Regiment, but apart from the bell and bugles, which were collected together by the Bermuda Maritime Museum at the former Bermuda Dockyard, um, the other items have been missing following her decommissioning, and there are many ideas on where they might have ended up, but broadly speaking, the idea is that some of the crew fancy keepsakes of their ship. I love the Crown Colonies. They're cute. They're not my favourite cruisers, but they're cute. So what do we have coming up? Well, we have the Tide class, Minotaur class, and Len Lease Act, all their long patrols. And of course, monitors are all maybe continuing from World War One. It's going to do the World War Two one as well. Uh, we have the Lend Lease Act, eighty years to the day on the eleventh of March. That's a fun one. I'm still going over that because there are a lot of interesting things in that act, and there's a lot of ships and stuff to cover. And I'm also looking forward to some more sci-fi, 21st of March, Bruce Ships 42. Empire Rising has released a couple of new part and new sections since I last talked about it, and it's good. And I'm hoping at least one of the others will have been come out as well a bit more. So, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this, as always. If you do like my videos, please do press the subscribe button. Maybe like it. It's always nice to have a light, and possibly even a little bell down there. There's a little bell. It's quite cute. And finally, thank you. Thank you to everyone who's joined Discord. Thank you to everyone who's joined Patreon. It's very kind of you to be in them. It's very kind of you to support my book, uh, my book buying habit. And it's very kind of you to do all you do for me on Discord when you're chatting away and you give me issues and questions. Because, as you know, both Patreon and Discord questions can end up here. But of course, the Patreon, uh, the Discord questions are entirely a sort of, you suggest them. If I like them, I put them in. It's entirely up to me. Uh, the Patreon ones, as, we, as I've explained before, what happens is there's a suggestions poll, uh, post opened. People put in their, uh, patrons put their suggestions down. And, uh, and then I select the six or seven, which I think I am most able to do and offer something interesting on. I put them into a vote, and then the two which get the highest votes go through. And often I have to say I do turn them into lives because I think that's more rewarding for the patrons than a long patrol necessary. But some become both a live and a long patrol. Thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed this. And for ones which are supposed to be 50 minutes, 
40 minutes, these are turning into quite often close to 50 minutes, aren't they? It's long patrols. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs>